All right. Let's do this. Okay. Go ahead and say something. So scrapbooking and home remodeling. We're yeah, in. whatever. This is what we're going with. Macrame. Wow, that's a 70s uh, art. Macrame. I can make some candles and hang them with macrame. Well, what was macrame? Remember the plant holders? Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. The macrame. Oh, this is, every house had one in the yeah, 70s. Yeah, and it was hair. right yes. next to your home entertainment center with cinder blocks and particle boards. Right up. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. all your stereo stuff. Yes, right. And you made a table out of a spool. My brother in law made one for me. Remember those old yeah, right, right. Oh, yeah. They made them into tables and you poured resin all over them. Remember like the, yep. the tires? Remember the spare tires, the plant the plant holders out of tires? Right. Yeah. Oh my god, we had so many of those in our backyard. We were the purest of white That's trash looking back on the shut tire up now. shops to get old tires, is that what it was? Yeah, I took home an NHRA <laughs> slick and put it in the bonus room and on a hot day. It smelled worse than a wire warehouse. <laughs> it was like my wife came and said, that thing is gone. It had that acrid smell. Oh, like, oh, put yeah, it in the restroom yeah. so you don't ever have the yeah, problem. Yeah. Are we recording? Oh yeah. Wrap it around oh. the toilet seat. And- oh, nice. <laughs> Was that you? No, that's the tire. Me. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. like the tire again. Yeah. Weren't me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, oh shall yeah. we? Who put we- the skid mark in the bathroom? <laughs> 12 inch wide skid mark. Burnout. <laughs> Went in the oh, tire right. shake. <laughs> <laughs> I got a beadlock on mine. <laughs> Just in case I blow one out. <laughs> like I said, I have to step up to get in the gutter. It always goes down to poop jokes. Yeah, well, oh, that's universal <laughs> truth, you know. That is that's that's language. what defines a man, right? It's the See? go-to. Are we on already? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> we, we can make this part. We can, let, let's do this the right way. Look at you with the giant ring. We were just oh, talking about smug. how we. Was that Super Bowl championship? What was that from? Ryan. He's got one. Hall of Fame ring. Oh. Wow. I'm that diecast Hall of Fame guys. Wow. He's like, well, well, we've got Hall of Fame rings. Like, oh, oh wait, you don't have yours? Ring knockers. Well, that's mine. I was not as big a part of it. A <laughs> <laughs> pinky ring. <laughs> <laughs> that's my Hall of Fame ring. <laughs> Jeez. You ready? Want to do yep, this? Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, welcome to the Round 6 Podcast. We are uh, live from the Grand National Roadster Show. And uh, I'm Brian. I'm Brad. I'm Alex. I'm Carson. And I'm Chip. <laughs> Here we are again. It's uh, it, it's like Chip Part Two, man. Thanks Uh-oh. for coming back. Part, part two. two. I haven't even survived Part One yet. <laughs> <laughs> part. You've been on a few times. See, this is good. Yeah, this repeat. is good. Repeat offenders. Without the sock or without the. Uh, yeah, I don't that. have my microphone sock today, <laughs> so you'll hear many popping peas. Ah, popping. We'll have to get you a ring for this too. <laughs> so, uh, have you guys walked around and checked out the car show yet? Barely. A Barely. Little. Barely. A so you don't have a pick for Amber yet. No, I uh, have one in my mind. Uh, yeah? I got yeah. one. Yeah. 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 What are you going? Glad with? you have one. Should we say it or? I think you should. I like the thirty-six. The thirty-six. 30, Very cool. Thirty-six is pretty impressive. I, yeah. I like the thirty-six. The underneath the panel insets on that thing, yeah. where they treated instead of a yeah. flat panel, they put an insert in there. Yeah. This is the second year in yeah. a row. I, I like the thirty-six. I like the thirty-six. Yeah. yeah. I like, like the ninety-two. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I was in the parking lot <laughs> next to the Yugo. <laughs> I'm going to pull for the Yugo this year. So can we, can we get a pick from you, or is this going to be – are you going to play you know, the – You uh... I honestly have not walked around. I've I've walked past and seen the cars, but it is very difficult for me to get there and study and, and yeah. focus on a car. Yeah. So I have not had that chance. I need to get in here. Hopefully tonight after the show closes, I can get That's in there what and we're hoping really for. check out yeah. some cars before I can give you a – Shall we say an educated guess? Right on. Right now, it's just a uh, a walk by guess. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say a just walking by, it's but t- it's tough I have, to do. I have my fifty foot favorites, but um, right on. You know, but uh, as far that as made- getting in and seeing who built the best car, but you know the difficult thing here is there's not a target on the wall in the shop when a customer comes in and says, "I want to build a car to compete for Amber." You used to know what it was going to be, right? But when you can hand build a complete car. And it gets beat by something that you can basically open a catalog and order all the parts for it. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't know where to go if a customer asked me to build them an amber winning car right now. Yeah. You know, it's you true. would think it, it is all over the board. You know, back That's... in the '90s, it would be a hand built car with right. an absolutely beautiful chassis, but we've done that twice and been beaten by cars that you can order through catalogs. And yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it's difficult. So I, I won't tell a customer that I can build them an amber car when you don't know where to go. And the reason for that is there is not a shall we say a rule book right there's nothing saying that you need to build something that's pulling the industry forward or going forward or moving and 
how much work have you done? It used to be that if you had a car with a roof and you had a car with fenders, you know, if it was a top and fenders, you could that car couldn't be beat by a car without a top and fenders. Right. right. But today, it's basically it's a pick. It's not a judged award. Well, it's interesting. That even the terminology "America's most beautiful roadster" is really a subjective term. It's not an objective term. Yeah. So what I find is, and I'm not disrespecting anybody's car, but what I find phenomenally built cars, cars that are just technically built well, painted well, polished well, great fitment. But using the terminology "beautiful" to me means it's cut, it's sections, it's made out of sheet metal and turned into a fender. I use the "beautiful" term as more inclusive of all the skill set instead of just like like not building one out of a catalog, but getting an existing car and building it period correct and making it look good right. and making it look great, technically great. But the beautiful term to me, I reserve for the cars that are like completely custom built. That's just yeah. me. Right. But, but see, beautiful is kind of a, that's an open term. And you know yeah. what you may like, I yeah. may not like, right. even right. though it, technically is it beautiful? Is the thing straight? Is it shady? Is it, right. is it detailed? Well, yes, but I may not like it. You may think it's the best thing ever. You know, you may go, well, yeah. I, I yeah, so that's kind of a yeah sliding well, scale. You're using an eye to be older. Let's take, I'd love well, to see the judging sheets. Well, here's what happens is they come in, they'll take pictures of all the cars that are contending. The judges go into a room, they put all the pictures up, and uh, everybody starts looking at it. There might be a car that's completely hand fabricated, and you know everybody goes, "Well, that's a beautiful car." But once it's, well, I don't like that style of car. You know, it's got too big of wheels and low profile tires. I like, I like a wide, thick tire. And everybody goes, "Yeah, I do too," or whatnot. And, so it, it is opinions that are getting there because by the time they go through the line of all the cars, you know, one guy says, on this car, I don't like the headlights. Okay. And then they get to a traditional car that's got tall tires and, you know, it looks like something that would have been built in 1964, 65. And nobody can pick it apart because they, you know, everybody still loves that honest hot rod look. Yep. And that's what ends up winning yep. because they can't pick it apart. Nobody can say anything negative about it's it. It's interesting. So is it a process of elimination or is it a process of optimization? Are they going to really thought about and eliminating what they don't like and what's left is wow. the survivor? Or is it optimized yeah. of who did the best with what they had? That's it's interesting, a different way of judging. Yeah, and it could be a car that's just, there's not a detailed chassis on it. So it's being shown flat on the ground on a piece of carpet rather than being lifted in the air and having a complete display. You know, that's right. that you know, care and take that you would take in building the bottom of the car to be, you know, something that could never be beat. That doesn't happen here. Yeah. Well, right. It's like, it's like if you look at a beautiful woman. I'd like to. Uh, uh, well, let's go find one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and if you're doing that in your mind, I mean, if you stop and consciously think about it, is it a process of elimination? Is it, oh, she has all these things. You is know, it additive? Yeah, exactly. Additive? Yeah. It, yeah. That's a weird, that's a weird way gonna, to look at it. I'm not going to compare women to cars in a car show because... I don't think that's politically correct. No, no. <laughs> we could get in letters. trouble doing that. Okay. Yeah, you don't put them up on a stand with mirrors under them. <laughs> what was that Steve Martin joke? I believe that a woman should yeah. be held high enough on a pedestal to look under her skirt. Look under, yep. That's All it. Right, we'll get in Sorry, trouble Nancy. saying this stuff. I know, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure it out. You know, it's like if you look at something, how do you gauge that? If you say, "Oh, that, that's a beautiful, beautiful couch." Yeah. You know, I mean, it's people collect yeah, like antique furniture. Suggested. You know, how do you choose? Yeah. What makes a Chesterfield look so much better than like, you know, an IKEA, like an Olmstead or whatever? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. but there is not a rule book for competing for Amber, which is crazy. I know, yeah. and I, there is a rule book if you're going to go uh, compete for the Riddler. Oh yeah, so you, you know what the to ISCA build. stuff, and but there is nothing to really, give you really, direction there, here. There, you have a basic set of rules you kind of follow. Oh, yeah. Build a Riddler then, yep. or something. You mm -hmm. no tanks. You know, this is. <laughs> Yeah. So with that yeah, thought, an amber car is a bit of a risk. Yes, it is. It's a huge risk to build. Just you almost got to go with something a little bit more comfortable to have a better shot at mm -hmm. it. But again, you don't set out to build that. I don't think. Yeah, I yeah. Think. You wouldn't well, want to. Why would you, you want, want to? to yeah. Some of these guys build it like on spec, like building a custom house at the beach, hoping they're going to find the right buyer. Do they build for themselves? Do they build with that target of trying to win the amber? I don't know. I'm glad they're building because it, it's moving yeah. the business forward. It's moving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, design boards, moving fabrication to techniques, and you're seeing more computer-based stuff in cars than ever before. Well, you're not seeing the hand-built, one-off cars that we yeah. used to see right. all the time yeah. because yeah. they don't necessarily win right. here. And, and technology yeah. allows people to make doors that fit well and panels that have the right gapping, yeah. but technology doesn't take care of design. So what I see is, we've said this before on the show, and what I see is cars that are sometimes great execution of bad design. The foreman of fit is 
the doors gaps are good, but the overall shape doesn't flow and the <laughs> yeah, trim's right. not in the right place, right. but it's executed well. Yeah. So it's good executed design, but it's not good design. And it's, and again, that's subjective. You know, how much of a chop top, yeah. how much of a fender section, how much chrome, that's all subjective, like looking at a woman, but still the technology now of ferro arms and, you know, reverse engineering and scanning and prototype parts, computerized metal forming now. Yeah. It's allowing more people to get into the market. More people are entering the market. Is that a good thing? Yeah, I think that's a good thing. It'll nominalize out eventually and, and equal out. Wow. See, you don't stop to think about any of that. No. And, I, no. So in a case like this, so this show's a little different. They bring the cars in. They have to drive by. You, you get a look at the car right. in motion doing what it's supposed to do, and that's mm -hmm. really cool. Well, it's also there's judges here that uh, – are professional builders building cars for customers and they're the judges when john buck asked me to be a judge i said no because i still have a shop i could possibly build a car that might compete here and to me that's a conflict of interest i don't want to be a judge where one year i say no i'm not judging this year because i have a car here well you know that, that doesn't work sense. to me you can be a People judge, that are you, still, you, can't be, you, can't, you can't make it a hit and miss thing so. professional builders that have a shop should not be judging this award yeah yeah. You know, if they sell their shop or retire, then they're qualified to be a judge, I think. I think they should have one Maybe judge. you didn't want my opinion, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Sure. <laughs> no, but that, that's, that's a good we'll, point. That's a, that's a good way to put it. No. When we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. Yeah, yeah. We'll issue you one. I wonder if they should have one judge every year who has nothing to do with cars, doesn't know a thing about it. Just bring somebody in and just go, have at it. Figure it out. One well, you, rogue you, judge. You've got editors and you've got professional car builders that are picking this award. Oh, which is and, great. So, uh, I mean, I think that's a badge of honor if you win it. It is. And you've done it how many times? I've been involved with nine cars that have won. Huh. Wow. You know, and, uh, but I've also brought cars in here that have lost that, you know, 20 years ago would not have lost because they were the best car in the show according to what the rules were if there were rules before but all of a sudden they got changed and they changed the rules and changed the judging and everything else and now like i say this is an opinion award it's a pick it's not based on what you've done how difficult it was to do it yeah. and how well you did it yeah. it's just based on what's that car look like and what all the judges want to drive it home it's to me it's the one car that they all have the mutual agreement on that's a cool car but Sometimes when you build something that's one off and a judge has no idea how to do it, he can't relate to it. Well, that's a tough deal. Yeah, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I wonder, like, coming here, you kind of have to, I wonder how many people make the choice between debuting a car here or waiting to do it in Detroit. And you look at some of the cars that don't win here and you go, if that car would have gone to Detroit, easy grade eight car, possible Riddler car. Yeah, and, and John changed the rules here where you used to be able to build a Roadster and go and compete and win the Riddler and then bring it here and win America's Most Beautiful Roads Award. But now if it's been shown, it's not eligible. So a lot of guys are coming here, and uh, that can be a problem sometimes too. Oh, I yeah. still think it should just be, uh, as a builder, I think difficulty is a huge part of this because it's real easy to buy a body and paint it absolutely perfect. But to hand build a body, design a buck and shape a buck and hand fabricate the steel body, you know, there's, there's a degree of difficulty that th there's other cars that can't even compete with that. And if it's done properly and it's done beautifully and timeless, you know, I don't think that a hand-built car should ever be beat by a car that is a production piece. Right. You know, and both cars are equally finished as well. The hand-built car, in my mind, that's somebody that went out of their way to build something new and different and hopefully push the industry forward. And you can't ignore that. Oh, yeah. I mean, from a flat piece of steel well, to something sculptured yeah. like see, that. See, I agree. It's like it's like just judging just a regular car show. You go to a burger place. You know, you got a brand new car, and you got a guy that's that's done this and this. Well, okay, factory paint job. You know, you say say a scale of ten points. You get your car. Factory paint job. It's t you know, five points. You just get five. I mean, there's no because it's you can buy it from the showroom. Yeah. Interior five points. My engine five points because. Anybody can go buy that. It's not necessarily a show car. It's just a yeah. car. So with what you're saying, it's that same type of deal. You can't take something that 
that came out of you know been stamped a billion times mm -hmm. and then something that you made the buck and, yep. and you got a million hours and that was a wasted panel that didn't work it's like just yeah. lost 40 hours of my time there and it's like okay there shouldn't even be a competition there because you're right. two totally different things and as a judge if a car were to come from back east out here and it happened to get damaged in in transportation i think when you come in and you uh register your car once you're here if you say look this happened on the on the way here that that should be forgiven because right. i know a lot of guys that have brought cars out and they get damaged they just put them back in the trailer and don't show it yeah, and that's, you know, that's, and that's I, I agree with you all that yeah. energy and effort yeah you know there should be you know bring it in if it got damaged you don't look at that it's waived because it's just an accident we, that happened we discussed that with it with a guest we had on the podcast who was going to the riddler yeah, loading his car in the trailer and it got damaged yeah. loading it in the trailer yeah. and they fixed it and he won the riddler award mm -hmm. i've had cars that came there, into he town he patched it up on the way to stopping at friends shops and fixing it along we've had cars that have come into town and they've called me and we've fixed them in my shop before they've competed here wow or on their way when it used to be in oakland on their way they get damaged yeah come by the so shop this is stuff i don't hear about you know i can't say that i've heard about this obviously yeah. you're in the link of hey we got this thing got the whole up cottage the industry wow. we repair your car and just yeah. strategically yeah. place shops yeah. along yeah. The Every, way. Yeah. everything else gets put on hold and we just fix that car and it goes yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome what's that like to in your mind to take someone else's work and have to you know obviously a repair is a repair when you get down to it right but i mean do you ever it's got to be weird to look at, you know, take someone else's work and just go, hey, I've got to fix this. I mean, obviously, with your, your name and your, your abilities and everything, to me, it wouldn't be an issue. If you said, oh, your car's got to go to Foose's shop to be fixed, they'd be like, oh, damn, I was really holding out for Mako. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, what's that like to, to get in and touch someone else's work? Is there, do you, do you push it with a different level where well, you, know, you have to go in and make sure that, that you do this guy's work justice and get it back to where it was? It doesn't matter what the car is or who it is. If you... If you have pride in your work, you're going to fix it correct no matter what it is. And when you fix something right, you don't want anybody to know that you were ever there. True. You that, just made it back to a, what it was. Is it tough to replicate you someone know, else's work that's, sometimes? Where That's a weird thing to no, do. No, no, no. It's, it's just like a, a factory car getting wrecked. You know, I grew up in my father's repair shop, you know, where we did insurance work. It's the same kind of thing, even with a custom car. Maybe you can't call up and order that part. You just have to refabricate it and get it chromed or straighten it out and get it repolished, whatever that part is. But if it's body and paint work, that's just simple body and paint work. No matter what right. it is, you just fix it. And the ultimate goal is to not let anybody know you were ever in there and you ever repaired it. Very nice. It was never damaged when it left your shop. I'll bet you the biggest trick is matching the paint. That's got to be a challenge on, on a car that you, you didn't do. Well, then I guess um, that's the point. Though. At this level, though, everybody's doing yeah. their best work. Yeah. So it's not like a guy's going to come in yeah. and, you know, you've got to go, I've got to replicate the orange peel that was on this yeah. car, well, you, know, you know, from the Thursday paint crew. That's guys will sit in the booth a little and different. add little colors right before they start spraying. It's not a, it's not a factory color. It's not a chart color. It's not a chip color. Nothing. So you got to no. hope for the best. Now you gotta, yeah, you're when you're in this industry, adding. you can look at a color and pretty much know what's in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. And you can just start yeah. playing around. And, you know what and it usually if the car is brand new and it's trying to make it to a show. Yeah. Then you can even get on the phone and say, okay, what'd you use? Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to tell you a funny story about matching paint. Years ago, I had a 55 Chevy. Uh, it was painted by Rod Powell, and it had some hood damage. And I bought the car 15 years after Rod Powell painted it. And I, and I just saw Rod at the induction last night for the Hall of Fame stuff. And we were talking about that story. I called him up and said, you don't know me, but I bought this car. It was owned by a guy named Manuel Adape, 55 Chevy. He goes, yeah, I know the car. I know the car exactly. I go, really? He goes, yeah, cream on the back, brandy wine over GM... Uh, Gunmetal gray in the front. I go, was that lacquer your thing? Oh, that was your thing. And he just started reciting. He gave me the formula of the mixing. So when I went to paint that hood and get it fixed, I went to a guy and a guy goes, where did you get these notes? This is like old school. You know, we don't even paint cars like this anymore. That's a Rod Pal paint job. So I saw him last night. He goes, hey, didn't you have that manual on Dope? <laughs> you talked about a guy who's sharp, but he knew in wow. his mind. He knew that formula. He knew what he shot the gun pressure at. Wow. Because his big thing was like when you're shooting metallics, that gun pressure and the fan pattern on metallics, you know, small parts of mica, how they lay down, how they orient, how quick you come back in, if they're layering in as you shoot them or they're sitting on top, that has to do everything with how it reflects the paint. And so he had a very particular, you know, PSI that tell him not to go above it, tell him not to go below it. I want it right at that number. I mean, you think about that, it's not just what chip would do, it's mm -hmm. not just the mixing, yeah. it's wow. how you run the gun, how quick you're loading it. 
do you do a tack coat for it? Let's get tacky and then come back in heavy. Do you let it sit for an hour, 45 minutes, 15 minutes? What's your temperatures? I mean, all that stuff. And even more so on the old paints that were really, really, you know, they had narrow bandwidth compared to the new paints. So, but yeah, but you talk about color matching. Rod Powell was like, this guy's a genius. It was almost like Stan Betts. Yeah. Who could yeah. match any paint in the world, no matter, he didn't even need yeah. to know what he was, it was. He was well known for he that. He could almost scratch it, sniff it, and tell you what it was. You know? <laughs> I met a guy named Michael Kent here today. And he was the original owner of my 67 Chevy pickup that I just oh, sold. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, oh, the nice. white one. He walked oh, up cool. and introduced wow. himself. That's that was awesome. pretty wow. amazing. That's he awesome. bought it brand new. He's the one that sold it to Kelly up there. Okay. And uh, I got it from Kelly. That's awesome. Kelly owned the uh, Pacific Classics right. consignment shop up in uh, Washington. That's where I went up and got it. Yeah. Kelly called me today and said, tell Chip I have another one just like it. <laughs> and I got another 67 in case he wants to do this all over again. <laughs> Funny. Very cool. See, this is this is all stuff we're learning here. This is good. This yeah. is that's the whole point. Paint and building roasters and I wonder how old school paint gets though with cars. Where some guys like we've got to go out and source this particular cocoa bean and grind it down to get the pigment out of it. <laughs> there are certain materials that some of the at this table know are not compliant in California. We have our connections over in Arizona, so <laughs> yep. they need to yeah, throw right. some lettering and pinstriping. I'm not going to use yeah. you know Home Depot paint thinner that's not even paint thinner it's actually right. acetone yeah it's called right. paint thinner i love yeah. the truth of labeling now but there are certain sources here at this table that will remain un unnamed that are sources there, it's, there's connections. Now. it's not even drugs we care about it's yeah. like getting yeah. paint thinner yeah or whatever it may be or, or i don't know what you're paint. talking about you, you, no, do no, time. Single stage paint. <laughs> you do time for bringing prep salt across the state yeah, line yeah. dude what are you in for murder what are you in for i brought some prep salt, I I brought some prep salt. Oh, dude you, yeah. you were one of those guys oh, yeah i'm asking for another bunk you're too scary i don't yeah. want you in my bunk i had some illegal pre-cleaner the yeah, pre exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 paint mule i like yeah. the car down you hide yours i had a can of bulldog <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, you you've got you've got a great display out here thank you yeah. across out um an amazing it's a it's a great walk through time what's it like to have a, a builder of the decade i mean you know it's funny Lord. uh you know john buck who owns the show now he called me and he said hey i owe you an apology and i said for what and he says well i always assumed you had been builder of the year with don tognati or dan sear the previous owners and i said no i never have been uh, I know that my father was once, but uh, I had never been. And he says, well, it's way past due. He says, I feel so bad. He says, I want to do something new for you. We've always done Builder of the Year. He says, I would like to make you Builder of the Decade. Wow. And uh, if, if you would like to participate, you'll be the first with this, with this honor. And I said, fantastic, let's do it. Awesome. I said, let me make some phone calls and see if I can round up some cars and I'll give you a call back. So I made some phone calls and all the customers that uh, were willing to bring their cars out, we, we all got together and yeah, we've had a great time here this weekend. So cool. Thank how, you. How did you make the choices? Did yeah. you get to choose which cars and um, was it a tough choice for you? Or? No, there's your staple cars that you really want to make sure are here, like the Grandmaster and uh, Impression. And I really wanted to bring Eldorod because that car had only been to SEMA and to Detroit then it went to the owner, and that's uh, Chris and Paul Andrews down in uh, Dallas, Texas. The car went to their, they have a collection of cars, went into their collection and had never been out of there. So we brought, I wanted, I wanted to bring it out so that Southern California and the uh, Grand National Roaster Show crowd could you know, and isn't that experience the first it? car you drew at Boyd's and the last car to be built for That was the very first car like that Alpha I drew Omega. for Boyd. Really? That's so awesome. And it was a car that he wanted to build for himself. So... It was started when I ended up, you know, two and a half years later after I drew it, I ended up going to work for Boyd full time. The car was just in the back of the shop and sitting right towards the end of, you know, the what I call the group of Boyds that I was with because he went bankrupt in 98 and it all went bankrupt. But around January of 98, Boyd said, we got to have that car done. And I think he gave us like three weeks. And we finished it. We called it Eldorado. It was that deep maroon color. Right. But if you look back at my original sketch, I wanted to do it blue with the moldings that are on it and wanted the white walls. Boyd wouldn't let me do all the things that I wanted to do. And Boyd hated blue, to be honest with you. So when Chris and Paul Andrews ended up with it, they asked me if I would redo the car. And I said, 
yeah and i sent them a picture of the original sketch and they said yeah that would be cool go ahead and do it so we changed the grill changed the top changed the wheels all the moldings both front and rear bumper were changed tail lights re were reworked the dash the steering wheel the center console basically there's not much of what was there before other than the chassis that we built at boyd's and that big block motor but we changed all of it. even the way that the motor is dressed is you know wow. completely different wow. but with the hood open on the right side of the uh cowl that covers the radiator i had dennis rickliffe who always did the lettering of hot rods by boyd on all the cars we built i had him letter this car again with hot rods by boyd and oh, i put cool. a foos logo on the left side because i wanted to honor the history of the car that's so awesome boyd is still a part of the car fantastic thank you yeah. then we, we saw have... the ghost of boyd today <laughs> seriously yeah, i'll show you a picture so I, really oh like, yeah somebody that was dressed like him no. uh, just yeah. looked like him oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. if this was like San Diego said, Comic Con, guys, Boyd's this guy there. would win like best cosplay there. now my favorite like, at, picture of the impression is when the car was in Del Mar I don't know who took the picture I found it online and it's a picture of the car with Boyd standing behind it looking at it and to me that's my favorite car because look, look at this picture. Boyd would never give me the time of day after I ended up not working with him again right because in boyd's world you either worked with him or, or you against worked against him. him and he wouldn't give me that shall we say uh satisfaction of knowing that he was appreciating something but in that picture i know he liked it <laughs> there he is wow <laughs> He lives. He Elvis does. lives. Yeah, that's right. You need to send that to me. Because now I have a picture of Boyd in front of my P32 and my. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's, like, that's why. That's why I shot it. Took that that's why I shot it that way. These have to be in the background. That's awesome. Thank you. I'll have to give him my number. Should I give it to you on the mic here? Yeah. Call anytime. Too cool. Has it changed in the past couple weeks? That's funny. It will. Yeah. Then we also have Wes Rydell's Cool Air, the '54 Chevy that we brought out. And that's such a cool car. I thank mean, that's, you very much. Speaking of tribute to history, that you, know, you, you kind of combined. Wes every... told me he wanted me to chop that car, and I said, you know what? I don't want to cut the windows. I just want to cut the top above the windows. So we pulled almost an inch and a half out of the top because the top of those cars. It makes really such a difference. Inch and a half out of the crown. Wow. Like that much of that? There's about an inch and a half out of the, the center of that car. Like ambulances. Yeah. Like the big, above the crown. Oh trunk. yeah. Like yeah. yeah. A such a huge like crown. <laughs> Got rid of the fifty four headlights yeah. and ran 55 Chevy headlights yeah uh, and blended that line into the side that goes down the, the side of the fender and into the door we used a 56 Chevy dash in it I love uh, it we've that got car. we've got a 56 or 55 Chevy front bumper on it and wow. uh, it's a I think it's a 55 Chevy rear bumper and I mean it's so many subtle modifications Doesn't it have um the first 427 or one of the prototype 427 yes, motors? Yes, Wes Rydell yeah. being a... Chevy dealer. He's one of the six dealers that GM works with to you know, influence what they need to do for the public. Okay. And Wes, he's a drag racer from back in the day, but he went ahead and went to uh, the powertrain division and he said, I want to build a motor and I want these heads, I want this block, I want this cam. He specced out all the pieces that he wanted and when they put it all together, it actually worked out to be a 427 yeah. cubic inch motor. And they said, wow, this is amazing. So that's a motor that came in the new Corvettes back in, uh, what was it, 2007, 2008? So West but Spectrum. that was the prototype wow. that they built, and we put it in this that's car. Really cool. that's now we rearched cool. the front fenders and the wheel wells, which lifted this, the molding that went down the side. And uh, when we brought that all the way back through the side, I left the lower molding where it was and made that uh, little balance that looks like a 57 Chevy insert. It was much smaller on the 54, what made it a little bigger, so it's a little bigger on this car. And, uh, you know, it's things that the deck lid being a little smaller, we got rid of the big hump in the back. All the things that we did, we wanted to look like this is the way the car should have come from the factory. It's, it has I don't such want a anything factory to smack, vibe to it. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. want anything to smack you in the face yeah. with, wow, look what they did, they changed this. Right. People look at this car and they have no idea what we did to it, but they don't know why it looks that, so different. that quarter trim? I, didn't, I had no idea. Yeah. I much, thought that was factory trim. Nope. It's taller. That so is awesome. A lot of real subtle little modifications. Because that rear 
bulb on the back of that car, that pronounced rear fender, always looked really thick and looked planted on. Yeah. Now it looks like it's part of the body. It looks like it a transition, there. not a yeah. plan on. Yeah. But that middle trim piece, like a 57, helps that because it balances your eye. It gives your eye somewhere to rest because otherwise you're looking at a big, giant, round shape, you know. Looks like you know, a missile and, or something. And the 54 Chevy headlight ring has a bunch of little milled slots in it. Okay. We went ahead and put the same rings on this car, but we handmade or we seen, excuse me, CNC machined those. Wow. But then we handmade the taillights in the back, and then scanned those or the the taillights and the little bezel, and we machined the same slots in those as well. So everything would look like they're factory, factory parts. Piece, yeah. But they're not. Wow. Then of course we've got the 0032 behind it, yep. which is a car that when I was at Boyd's we built the Boydster. Yeah. And. I wanted to build a car for myself, so I drew up a full fendered Boydster version with a little, what I call a bikini top on it, mm-hmm. and I had a five spoke knockoff wheel on it, and uh, started building that. Paid Boyd to build a chassis for me, you know, bought that out of the shop, and then I took that out to have Marcel's, and I was going to work with him to build the body. And we had another customer named uh, Buzz Devasta. He came to the shop, and he asked me how. I had a motorcycle that was going, one of the Little John Speedsters. Yeah. And that's what I actually traded to Boyd to build the chassis for this car. <laughs> and Buzz asked me how my motorcycle was coming. I said, well, I actually traded that to Boyd, and uh, now I'm building a full fendered version of the Boydster with a little top on it. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. He walks away, and then later that afternoon, Boyd comes over and he says, Buzz DeVosta wants your car. And, you know, I work for the company, so yeah. I gave it up for Buzz. Wow and went ahead and built it finished it did the whole thing with marcel's and brought it back to the shop boyd had never seen that car the whole time it was out at marcel's until the day i brought it back to the shop and boyd walked into the shop and fell in love with it he says i want that car build something else for buzz so then i started building the 34 so i built the 34 at the shop that we were building that was bought out of the shop Basically, everything was finished except the running boards and the doors at Marcel's. And Barry White bought that car. We finished it, and it won the uh, Amber Award. I forget what year, but for Richard Burke. Finished by, uh, you know. Wow. And then, so Boyd, all of a sudden, this was Boyd's car. Yeah. And Boyd told me he wanted a yellow with a yellow interior, no top. And he made a starfish-looking wheel that went on it. And to be honest with you, I was heart sick when I when when it was done because of what I really wanted yeah. to do to it. Yeah. Well, Chuck Spados out of New York bought that car out of the auction when the bankruptcy happened, and he called me up and he says, "I understand this was your car originally," and I said, "Yes," and he says, "Well, is it everything you wanted it to be?" And I said, "No, not at all." And I said, "I'll send you a sketch." So I sent him the sketch of the car, black with the little top and the five spoke wheels, yeah. and he says. Well, what would you charge me to build this car like that? And I said, don't change this car because this car has history. I said, yeah. why don't I just build you a new one and you sell that one? He says, no, I want you to do this one the way you wanted to do it for yourself. So I gave him a price. He sent it to us. We built it, and it won the 2000 Amber Award when yeah. it was up in San Francisco. Wow. And the night it won, I went to uh, Denny's with Chuck Spados, the owner, at 4 in the morning. <laughs> he says, what else are you working on at your shop? And I told him that I had a three-window coupe that I was building to look very similar to his car. He says, oh, I love the idea of a coupe. He says, why don't you take that car back and you can build the coupe for me? And I said, well, I've got to finish Impression and I've got to finish a car that we ended up calling Stallion for Ron Whiteside. I said, so it's going to be like five years before I finish it. Keep your Roadster and when I finish the coupe, if you want to trade, I'll trade you. He says, all right, we'll see. The next week, the title for 0032 comes in the mail with a note that says, do whatever you want with this. The coupe is mine. So I called him up and he says, I don't care if you have to sell the car or whatever. He says, but the Roadster's yours. You've got your car back. He says, I want the coupe. So when you finish the coupe, it's mine. Wow. I'm in no hurry. I said, wow, okay. Well, I had just recently moved my shop. And sorry if this is going on and on, no, but no, I've got some great stuff. stories about this all this great stuff. Good. No, no. But I had moved my shop, and I was subleasing from Mick, who's the painter out at SoCal yes. Speed Shop. Mick he Jenkins. had mixed paint in Huntington Beach, and I was subleasing the other side of his building. 
and that's where we finished the car before it won the uh, Amber Award. And he comes over to me one day and he says, hey, the building uh, just sold. We got to move out. <laughs> I didn't have two dimes to rub together, so I didn't even have enough money to move to another location. So I said, who's the real estate agent? He gave me the real estate agent's number and I called him and I said, I understand the building sold. He says, well, we're about to go into escrow, but uh, yeah, we got an offer of 265 on the building. I said, I'll give you 285. He says, really? So then it became a, it was, it was basically a, a battle of who was going to pay more for the building. Yeah. And I got into this bidding war. Like I say, I didn't have two dimes Man, to rub that together. Is risky. But I did have that car. Oh, well, okay. And the RM auction up in uh, Monterey was happening. So I entered that car into the auction and I put a reserve of 300,000 on it, knowing that if it went for 300, I would get 270 out of that because okay. you got to pay 10%. Yeah. Right. So I put it in the auction and I went up there and the car sold and uh, I brought my reserve off. The car sold for 264, but they gave me a check for 250. And I put 150 in the bank and uh, to build the coupe, and I put $100,000 down on the building, and that's how we ended up with Foos Design. Wow. Without that car, awesome. I wouldn't be wow. here today. That car sold that is awesome. That's, that's great. So that is awesome. If you look Holy at every crap. show sign that I've ever built where there's the team that worked on every car, Chuck's Fatos is on every sign because well, without Chuck, part of your yeah. we wouldn't be here. He your history. Now, I finished that car. It was about five years later, and... Uh, Chuck wanted to sell it, so I sold it, and it went to the Peterson Museum, where it sat with this car, the yeah. two sisters that I call it, the, the three-window coupe and the Roadster. Oh, and now, wow. 32 footnote, that's a car that won AMBR twice. No, right? it only it, it only won, won once. once is black yes, and, okay, we never gotcha. would. Okay. When we the finished yellow, yellow it, never went in? Okay. we finished it, and we took it to the uh, Grand National Roadster Show up in uh, Oakland, Oakland when it was there, or it was actually it was in San Francisco then. And the reason that we didn't show it is a good friend of Boyd's and mine, Tom Gale from Chrysler, uh -huh. head of head of all design. He had built a roadster for himself and was competing. Okay. And I told Boyd, I said, let's just display only and okay. not compete against Tom Gale. Oh, we didn't want to beat him. Okay. And uh, so we went up there and had it on display only. It may have won that year. I don't know, but it did win when we turned it into 0032. Well, it sure became the basis of all the fiberglass reproduction. Boyd's yeah, cars right. were sold and a yeah. lot of... A short series of ten of them. Yeah. The the Rock Roadster that's the magnitude is derived from that design pretty much. Yes. So that now, car's got a great I mean that's the first one. It's got a great lineage. Great the lineage. reason that happened is, you know, it wasn't long after we finished the Boyster two. When I brought the Boyster one and the Boyster two into the shop, every customer that we had that would walk in would say, I want a car like that. <laughs> I want a car. So I told Boyd, I said, We should do a run of these. And Boyd said, no, we're not going to do a run of those. You know, we'll just build one-offs. Okay. So then Boyd's went bankrupt, and I called Jerry Kugel. And I said, Jerry, <laughs> I've got a design that I want to show you. It's a little different than the Boyster and the Boyster 2. It's, it has a complete cowl and a smaller hood and a simpler windshield where I did a Duvall windshield but with curved glass. And I said, I would like to build 10 of these non-fendered and 10 full fenders and use your chassis, but let's have Marcel build them. He said, well, bring it up and show it to me. So I went up there and showed it to him, and that's exactly what we did, and that's where the Miroc came the from. The Miroc, yep. Yeah. And uh, wow. yeah, awesome. Jerry had enough yeah. foresight and enough backing that we could actually build them, and it was a pleasure to be involved with that project yeah. as well. Yeah. So one of the full fenders was uh, Jerry Magnuson that bought it. He called me up and said, I've got one, and I would like you to finish it. Yeah, Jerry's and, a great, well, was, still in my heart is, one of the greatest customers when I was working with Chip we ever dealt with. Consummate engineer. This guy was engineering proficient, man. He was old school engineering, like protractor, you know, uh, you know, uh, slide rule kind of guy. He built the car himself. Yeah. I went up and did the buck for the top. We built that at Marcel's. But uh, all the internals and all the hard stuff to do on that car was all built by Jerry and his team up at Magnuson's. Wow. All we did really was we kind of finessed a few parts but we painted it and assembled it and then competed for the for the Amber I did, Award here. I didn't here. know that. I didn't know he put the car together. Didn't Kenny Duttweiler build that engine? Yes, he did. Yeah, Kenny Duttweiler, yeah. real famous engine builder, yeah. uh, built that engine. Yeah, so, I, did, I did not know that. We, we, we built the, the engine cover yeah. and just some of the dressing on the on the car, but Jerry really did 
99 yeah. percent of that car miles himself. on that car, that car oh yeah he drove was across country trailer queen. Time. Got power tour. well yeah. when we competed again for the amber we completely rebuilt that car took it all apart repainted about 50 percent of it because he had so many miles on it and built a complete new exhaust system on it because the exhaust system looked like it had been back and forth on a cheese grater about 40 times. <laughs> oh, the, the bottom of that car was really a mess. Yeah. That's before awesome. We brought That's it here. awesome, he though. And uh, that was when the judging had changed, and uh, yeah. we didn't win, which shocked yeah. me on yeah. a 100% hand-built car. That, that Well, your car that, that year, and I was, on a, I was on a roll for a lot of years where I could pick the winner. I walk around, and it's like, there's your winner. And I was pretty good at it. You should have won that year. Oh, so yeah. thank you. When, when I got the phone call, it's like, wait, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. What? No, that was so, a shock. And it wasn't like I was trying to be down, but it's no, like, it's, it's, if this is what, it, if this is what the everything is all about, this detail, and this and this and this, this thing killed. So the car had cool touches. Well, I've heard After rumors that, I about. Gave up. That was that was like. I've heard rumors about what happened with all the judges and whatnot. And, oh, uh, dude, there's you know. some of the stories that I heard from different <laughs> hot rod friends of mine. You know, there was the some... night that we were putting the car back in the trailer and leaving here, John Buck came over to me. He says, everything okay here? And I said, <laughs> why are you asking me? I said, I got to ask you. I said, uh, did the best car w- here win? And he looked at me. He says, no. I said, everything's okay here, but I don't think it's okay with you yet. <laughs> And he just kind of looked at me, and uh, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting comment. So we probably should have started this whole thing with uh, the disclaimer: the opinions expressed in this show, <laughs> <the opinions laughs> of, any any potential lawsuits or defamatory statements can be directed to. Yeah. I'm only team. speaking what I know and right. what is true. Yeah, I can yeah, back up right. anything I say. Do these differently people... for now. We have to have one lawyer sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's good to get the perspective and the inside. Too, I never once said allegedly. Crazy. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> we'll go back and put it in post. <laughs> it's all water under the bridge. Well, it, yeah. Yeah, it is what it is yeah. now. Yeah. This yeah. is a hobby, and we're all having fun. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Some shows end great, some don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you left the alarm off? Really? Is that one That's got to be coming from the Ford booth. Those are the only cars <laughs> with alarms like that. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so you driven your uh, your truck lately? I have not driven my truck lately because uh, Magnaflow actually was storing it for me down in their lobby for about a year and a half. We pulled it out of their lobby just to bring it here, but I'm going to take it back home and start enjoying it again. Oh, such Drive a good-looking truck. Oh, yeah. man. I was, I was telling Alex, I've been in it a couple of times back when you were at Boyd's when it was brown. You know, yeah. In the old days, yep. when it had the champs on it. And just a, I've, just I've driven truck. it and enjoyed it since it's been in the version that it's in now. But, you know, when, when you're out of room in the shop and you have no place to park it at home and... And Magnaflow says, do you have a car we can put in the lobby? I do. Yeah, take my truck. <laughs> yeah. free, free storage. And like I say, it had been there for about a year and a half. Wow. Just, I hadn't even seen it. I hadn't been down there myself. But uh, did, you know, it it's, get, did it get beat up or was it okay? No, I mean, it still, still looks I mean, great. Nobody, you kind of wonder when it's sitting around. It's like, oh, I hope the thing doesn't get nope, they, smacked. Well, once or... I found out they had free storage, I sent my boat over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the lobby. It's in the back. There you go. And it's full of mufflers. <laughs> Rusted old ones. So it's a mobile storage I unit now. Yeah. Storage down there. Feet are great. So if you'd like to store it in the round six lobby, or as we call my garage, yeah, feel free. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It'll you know. get started every day. Guaranteed. I'll make sure. Yeah. And actually, in uh, when we were trying to finish a few cars for SEMA, we needed more space in the shop. So I asked Magnaflow if I could put. Uh, we actually had my five window coupe and the P32. And my truck, all three of those were down in their lobby. And Hemisphere had been down there at one time, too. Hemisphere was down there at one time, but I just had uh, Jeff, our electrician, completely rewire that car and finish it up. So that one's going to be on the street here. He says he's got about two days left to finish it up, and I'll start driving that one. That's got to be a fun car. So does it run right now, or does it not? No, it runs. I've actually driven it. Okay. But it had a few issues that needed to be uh, We had talked about the, some, of, some, of the, some of the weird little things yeah, that had yeah. like lights and air conditioning, just switch stuff. You well, know, kinda. I had brought Jeff, because we built that car at, Ma- at uh, Metal Crafters, and Oscar was their electrician who started that car and was having problems, couldn't finish it, and I brought Jeff over to help them get it finished. And Jeff just got it to where we could get it to SEMA, and then it ended up going on tour, was going all around the country, but Jeff told me, he says, I'd really like to tear all that out and redo it and make it proper. And uh, finally, just about eight months ago, I finally set it up for Jeff to, and Jeff ended up taking that car completely down to basically just the body on the chassis and oh. was redoing all of it 
got it back together just so we could have it at this show. But he says, I need about two days to dial it in. So I got to tell you, one of my favorite stories on the hemisphere is how that thing came to be. We uh, had signed a licensing deal with a diecast company, a competitor to Hot Wheels called uh, RC2. And uh, they were going to do all the Foos cars. And so we wanted to do something to promote. They wanted to do something to promote. And I said, well, Chip's got this project, this car he designed at Art Center that really is the, the embodiment of Chip and that whole look. And it started his career. And you look at the Prowler. You look at Tom Gale. You get what he did, his senior project. He said, how about if we give you naming rights on that car? We'll call that car the JL Full Throttle. And you give us seat money to build a full-scale car. And we'll promote it with you guys and, and take it around. They went, oh, that's a great idea. So they started that process. I had then uh, left Mattel and was working with another company and then eventually worked with Chip. So my first day in the office, uh, when I walked in, I said, hey, so what's on the agenda for today? He says, well, we're going to go to Metal Crafters. We're going to talk about building the hemispheres. And I said, huh? I said, no, we're only building one of those. It's under the contract with JL Full Throttle. We're building one as just a, you know, a, a concept car year old alone. He goes, no, we're going to build 50 of them. And I said, well, how the hell are we going to do that? He goes, well, that's what you're going to handle. So I'm like, okay. So, I mean, I like how the we went from we to you. Yeah, so, yeah. so, telling stories, warts and all, what was interesting is I think five or six of those got built, Chip. And we ended we, up doing five of them. Only five. And we never got to the 50 because we couldn't get insurance and indemnification from Metal Crafters. They wouldn't give it to us. So, what happened is Chip designed that car on paper. He sat with a computer designer. And that car was completely built from computer-based models and engineering. Right. Hotchkiss did the suspension. Chip worked on the chassis and body. And so it was all transferred from Chip sketches into the computer. So if you look at intellectual transfer, it's Chip's designs, but the aspects of motion, analysis, mean time to failure, all the stuff you look for engineering is their risk because they entered it in the computer. So all I needed to be able to get those cars registered was insurance and identification. So insurance and identification in our world is like the two safety nets you have it, 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 it indemnification is first if something goes bad i got your back i'll protect you if indemnification fails and it goes to insurance that's where people get paid well they wouldn't do it so unfortunately we had to cancel the project because of that yeah because of that now here's the real kicker chip came to me and he said look i, I can't really pay you for doing this and doing all this extra work to get these 50 cars built but here's what i'll do They've already looked at where their break-even analysis is. And right around 19 or 20 cars, they start breaking even. So I arranged for car number 22 to be yours. So to kill this project, I had to shoot my own puppy. Oh. I had to say you can't build those cars, where if it would have got to 22, number 22 would have been mine. So, you know, but then you have to look at the bigger picture. It's like if something fails on that and hits hurt somebody and we don't have insurance identification and Chip wasn't responsible for the engineering Right. Then it all falls back on him. So you have to have those veils of protection. So we had to, we had to kill the project. And yeah, maybe it's better there's only five. Definitely helps the provenance. So I was going to ask if you'd ever driven it, you know, and how much yeah. fun oh, it yeah. is. Yeah, I've driven it days. Quite, a, yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, we I tracked it. it. That car drives awesome. I've driven it on I the bet freeway. It's a fun car. Uh, we actually had a, um, I had a car stall in front of me, just come to a dead stop, and I did a panic stop. And, uh, in the panic stop, turned the wheels to the right, let my foot off the brake, and jumped around that car and just barely, barely missed it. So I almost stuffed that thing up once. Oh. <laughs> the horse part of weight ratio on that thing is amazing because it's around 500, 550 horsepower, I think, and I think it weighs like 2,300 pounds. Oh, it's, yes. so I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's like Indy cars. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's like, oh, not nice one, go it's cars. just an Indy car ish, you know, when you it's, look at yes. horsepower it's weight. It's 600 and some horsepower, okay. I forget what it is, 640. 640 horsepower and uh, 230 or 2,360 yeah, pounds. Yeah, my numbers were off, but, wow. close, but yeah, amazing. Wow. Fun car to drive. Faster took than a, most a, street bikes. Took a week to wipe the <laughs> grin off your face and you got out of that, even after the close call. Oh, yeah. No, it's a blast to drive. <laughs> Smile was so big, it looked like I had a coat hanger stuck in his mouth. <laughs> now, originally, I didn't want the glass behind the, the passenger compartment. I thought, you know, just have it an open engine and, and be a part of the interior. I thought, you know, we'll run the exhaust out, it'd be quiet enough. Not when you put your foot in the throttle. When it's idling, it's fine. But you can hear kinda, it inhaling just yeah, fine. You know, I, the the theme was kind of like almost a, uh, you know, like a ski boat where the motor's behind you, yeah. and you know that's fine on a boat on a lake. There's no roof above you. Yeah. You put a roof above you, and it traps all that sound in there. Hence the name Hemisphere. Got tired of flooring it and passing out from yeah. lack of oxygen. Snaps your head back <laughs> from the suction yep. of the intake. And Stu Hillborn did the injection. Uh, yes. On that. Wow. Stu Hillborn. Wow. Well, here's the other story that I like. I'm all about stories. Is the first engine wasn't the 392 Hemi. The first engine was the last complete engine Dick Landy built. 
with Dick Landy really? found out about these things, I want to build that here? engine. Uh, I have that motor still at the shop, but Last Dick Landy engine. built a motor yeah. that Chrysler paid for. Yeah. Wow. When I, Tom Gale arranged for that. When I did the Prowler, it was my senior project at Art Center. Right. I designed a model that became the production of, was the inspiration for the production of Prowler. And I made a great friend with Tom Gale when I, uh, when I did that as a student at Art Center. And we stayed in touch. And in fact, when I did the uh, Sniper with, with Troy Trepanier, I called Tom and said, hey, Tom, we're going to build this 53 Belvedere. Do you think we could get a uh, Viper motor for this? And he said, you know what? I'm going to give you a complete uh, engineering car that you can take the whole chassis out of. Wow. So he donated a whole car to us that had been clocked at 230 miles an hour at Daytona. And that was the Viper deal? That, that was, was, yeah. So yeah. I called Troy okay. and I said, uh, call this number. They have a complete Viper for you to go pick up. And that's how we got the running gear for the Boy, sniper. You were Santa Claus that year. <laughs> that was probably one of the first hot rods with a Viper motor, wasn't it? Wasn't. Yes, it oh, was. Yeah, 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 that was it. That was the first yeah, one. Yes, so when Tom heard so, about the atmosphere being built, he said, "Well, I got an engine for you. I'll well, get one it, built for you." It was actually the same show that we took the Boyster Two to. When I was uh, going to say in San Mateo that year, when, when they had, that's yeah, where I first saw it. I saw that there. That well, that was when a great year. Tom, that was the year that Tom Gale was showing his personal roadster. Right on. And uh, that's at the same time that. I had given my little John Speedster bike to Boyd to build the chassis for the Boyd or for my Boyster two, right and then Buzz wanted the car, so we did the trade. Now it was Boyd's car, and we were doing the thirty four. So then Tom came in, and when when Boyd wanted the car for himself, I said, "You can have this car, but I want the chassis for my Hemisphere." So we were building the chassis at Boyd's for my Hemisphere, and I had the motor from Dick Landy or I didn't have the motor from Dick Landy, I had just started collecting parts to build a 426 Emmy. And saw Tom Gale up there and uh, I told him, I said, you remember the model that I built for, for Chrysler? I said, I'm actually gonna build that car. And he said, what are you doing for a motor? And I said, well, I have parts to build a 426 Hemi. He says, can I give you a 426 Hemi for that car? I said, I would love that. He says, we are about to release a brand new one. So he says, I'll have a guy call you and, uh, you know, I want to supply the motor for that car. I said, thank you very much. Wow. So Jim Bratton, who is the head of Mopar Performance, he called me that week and he says, uh, Tom says, I got to build you a, a motor. And I said, well, what, what do you want to build? And he says, I don't care what you want. He says, whatever you want. He says, you want a top fuel 426 Hemi or whatever <laughs> you want. He says, that's what we're building. I said, well, I don't need that. I said, I just want a street car. And he says, all right, he says, uh, here's who you need to call, Dick Landy, and he's going to build whatever you tell him to build. <laughs> so I called Dick Landy, told him what I wanted, and Dick says, all right, we should build cast iron block with aluminum heads. That's he true. said, being that you're going to run it in the back, he says, let's do a 40% uh, smaller pulley on the uh, on the water pump so it'll pump it through that, that direction. And this thing, he says, I'll just dial it in. It was... 495 uh, horsepower went on the dyno and he said you could you could rest a quarter on that thing and stand it on edge that it ran so smooth oh. so I, I still have that motor and never finished it but Wait. when we started it again because then Boyd's went away and I put the car on the back burner and it was uh, boy 98 to 2007 nine years later that I started building the car again and uh, being that Metal Crafters worked so close with Chrysler, I got a phone call from the guys at Mopar Performance and they said, we would like you to use a new a new Hemi because they were just about to release the new Hemi. Right now? And I said, great, let's do it. So that's, we still use the name Hemisphere, but we use the 6.4 liter Hemi. Do you have any plans for that motor though? The, uh, the I have motor? no plans for that motor. It's just been sitting there and I... Uh, you want to I, store that in the round six? Uh... <laughs> so there's another interesting side note on the terminology in the name hemisphere so i got i gotta tell the other part of the story i'll tell this so chip doesn't have to so uh they you know they're gonna build 50 of them so chip's talking to the guys about getting 50 of these new motors and it's all great and everything's going good until we get a letter from chrysler corporate legal that says chip foos cease and desist you can no longer use the word hemi in any way shape or form we own the name we're like wait no no, no. i owned it for clothing owned, and toys and die cast yeah, he owned hemisphere with the f-e-a-r 
for toys and die casts. And already done the Hot Wheels car. It already the toy. It was a toy car before it was a real car. So he'd already registered that. Chrysler's Link claimed that the word Hemi as the first part of that word that they owned, and that you couldn't use any derivative. Well, and so Chip came back and said, "No, I've already used it for clothing. I've already used it." And they said, "Oh no, we own that name." We're like, "No, you can't, unless every globe manufacturer can't put." You know, Western Hemisphere on a globe. Right. Well, so, I owned it for clothing and right. die casts and toys, and I owned it for vehicles. Right. But my vehicle uh, registration had lapsed, right. and I hadn't renewed it. So while we were at SEMA, Chrysler got it oh, and renewed it. Right. And now they owned it for vehicles only, and they wanted me to give them yeah. my ownership of Hemisphere for toys and clothes, right. and they wanted to license it back to me. And we said that's not going to happen. My favorite line, and I won't attribute it to who it is, but he knows who he is. Um, we said, you know, this is, doesn't even make sense. There's nothing about this that makes sense. It's not ethical. It's not right. It's not proper. Chips had it. Chips used it. You're basically trying to grab something. And he said, oh, we don't have to be right. We just have to crush you. Wow. Meaning they have so more So that's, that's when I went so to Ford, went and to Ford. we put Ford motors in them, and we <laughs> call it the Foose Coupe instead of the Hemisphere. So oh, we there you neener, go. Neener, they said, neener. no, 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 we still want you to use yeah, the yeah, Hemis, yeah, and yeah, we want to license the name yeah, to you. I said, no. Yeah, I already built one. That's all I ever wanted. I don't have to keep building hemispheres. I own the name for toys and clothing and everything else, so I can do everything I want to do with it. Yeah. Now I can create Foose Coupe and do everything I want to do with that as well. I can do it all over again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Classic. So wow. if you want to crush me, I'll go a different direction. Well, so right. go back to the beginning, you know, when they're, when people are giving you this, like go back to that thing here. It's like, holy crap, you have awesome friends. We're going to give you this and this, and this is pretty awesome. So I must speak from the bottom of my heart, you guys suck. <laughs> so much. You got to get some new friends. I got to get better friends. Got you, Del Taco. I, mean, I got a water and a granola when I sat down here. I'm, I'm counting plus already. I'm way ahead from where I started. Free water and granola. I'm in. Chip gets and motors. And I give you stuff chassis. every time you come to the shop. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, that that is a bad true. time. You're, heartburn. I, you're, you're out of that, you're out of that deal. It's these two guys. These, uh, it's t-shirts <laughs> that you can wipe your cars down with. Right. They're old t-shirts that I've already worn. It's but already worn. It's still something that I've given you. that DNA. Yeah, get yeah, your little yeah, Petri dish. Start They've got paint on them. My sure. wife says I can't wear them anymore. Right. So, yeah. all right, you know. Here, I'm giving these to Brad. <laughs> Tell him I pulled them out of that trailer. Those are brand new. These are these are the new ones. I gave you advice once when we were in Carsland. Give me advice to a sell times. your toolbox. You did. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. And it's, and that it's was still right. there. That was that yeah. was there. That was and we talked about that. And more I also than told once. you to put the little crown on it. You told me that one. So smart. I wasn't you, even marking. If you go on put the crown on that toolbox. We don't do. If you go on Radiator Springs, the ride yep, there in it is. Uh, Cars Land, and when you go through the paint shop. There's a pinstriping box on the ground with paint spilled all yep. over it and everything else. And you'll see a king's crown yep. on the side of that toolbox. Right in front of that was Brad name. King's that was, toolbox that, that the engineers and all of the uh, decorators from Imagineering said, hey, do you want to sell your toolbox? And Brad says, no, I use it all the time. And I said, no, sell it to him, but put the little crown on there so you'll have a piece of memorabilia in that ride. For thank, eternity. Thank you for that. Yes. But the funny part about that box is remember what you thought, what your personal opinion on that box was when you guys rolled down there. I was I was embarrassed because I knew Jeff was going down, Jeff's going down. I was like, these guys got their new stuff. I get this all piece of crap eight box. This thing is like barely together anymore. You know? Now so what get, Brad doesn't know is we get down there. I set the thing there. We're there not even 15 minutes. We're inside of the ride area. We started in the paint booth. You know, you're you're kind of delegating what we're going to do. So Jeff is over here. I'm over here. And... Um, and Dennis comes over and he goes, hey, the Imagineers are all kind of flipping out on your paint box. I said, what? And he goes, they, they want the paint box. What are you talking about? He goes, I'm not kidding. So he goes back to 15 minutes later, you come walking up. Dude, look, they want the paint box. Who wants the paint box? This thing is a piece of Somebody. crap. So I bought Brad a brand new toolbox, and then I sold his old one for five grand. There you go. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> that whole experience was awesome. Those guys treated us so well. Oh, it was wonderful. It, it I don't was, remember what you got. I think it was a lifetime. Uh, got, you can go in and out of oh, Disneyland anytime you want. I wanted that, but that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, it was nice around, It's a small world. Anytime you want. Yeah. <laughs> when Disney asked me to work on, on that whole project, I said, sure, I'll do it. I said, I'll do it for free if I can have a, you know, if my whole family can have a lifetime pass to Disneyland. And they said, no, we'll pay you for work and you pay us when you come to the park. Yeah. Okay, uh, fair's fair. Right. <laughs> it was nice they did both for Chip and I, the paint cans with our birthdays and initials on, which is kind of fun. Yeah. So 
That's kind of And cool. both your names are on the cans that are in the paint box, yeah, that's too. Right, that's but right. But your names yeah. are actually yeah. on there. So yeah, nice. But you had a lot to do with that, too, though. You're the yeah, one who did. Made uh, you made those little I did. Files, I made yeah. those. I'm, yeah. I'd like to think I'm the only guy outside of Imagineering that actually has the computer files for those paint cans. Yes. That's right. I actually that's right. Kathy got, Mangumson and I just got those to things. And and my name. I'm, they're on my computer, and I'm yeah. laughing, going, i got to be the only guy outside of Imagineering that actually has Disney files. Yep. That's awesome. We had a lot of fun in there. That was, that was a fun project because Chip got to be involved thing. in the movie from the very beginning, got to be involved in the park from day one, from breaking the ground to, to the very end, all the work, all the pinstriping, walking through it every day. I mean, that's like that was that whole thing was. Oh, I wouldn't. I awesome. wouldn't get rid of that memory. Yeah. That was yeah. that was awesome. We had a lot of good times in it. It took longer because we waited for you. You know, you're like, oh, oh, oh I didn't know what gate oh, no, 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 no. Every you're, day he went through, he went to a different gate. You, no, it's not waiting for him to show up. You, okay, so hold on, let me rephrase that thing. When we first went down there, he had to leave the next day to go to a, a show in Sweden or something. He's like, man, I wanted to be here. I'm like, all right. You know, so the guy's like, can I come in this weekend? It's like, no, let's wait till Chip gets back. So we worked around your schedule. So what would have taken normally a couple of weeks, it was like, Three or four months well, cool. also, because we had to work, work more until work. you were there. We kept you know? expanding the PO because first it was just oh, paint was, one area, then it was yes. paint this. It was yep. in. And finally, they said, oh, you do this? just paint what you need to. Just do what you It I was like great. The, the paint booth, too. Chip walked in there and he said, why is the paint booth so clean? Well, this we're just building. Chip goes, no painter's paint booth is this clean. So <laughs> oh. they're splattering paint. Oh, he stuff came around. in and he's like, asking. It's like, no, dude, yeah. you got you to gotta mess up yeah, the filters. You got to have paint spilled. You know, no use, the, use a test oh, pattern on the wall. On the wall like, you know, like you're dialing the gun in. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, you make it accurate to the experience. That was a fun deal. That was a blast. So that was a lot We were in there fun. for, what, about four months? Going like, back and forth. It was like three or four months. It was a yeah. while until yeah. you kind of went, we got to get this wrapped up. Yep. They want to open the park. Overman. Yeah, yeah, what's was, weird is when you a, tell the story, I imagine it happening in like two or three days for some reason. I just the way you tell it, it's just like so quick, and I keep thinking there had to be so much more time. There's no way you guys move that fast. So three to four months makes oh, sense. Yeah. I mean, it was, and it it was you did some beautiful work in there. Thank you. And Jeff Styles, whose right. his last name is really Overman, but we had yeah. Jeff Styles on on you know at the gate when you had to get in. He didn't have a license that matched the name that he had given. So, <laughs> well, he, okay, and that deal, when we pulled up, that was the best thing. We pulled up there. All right, we need your license. They get the they get the big big bars up there, and you know we're we're in your truck. You're driving, and everybody hands their license because they go, we have a problem. The only guy that actually has his real name on his license is Dennis. Nobody else is matches their Chip wasn't in that. My legal name is Douglas, but I was actually named Chip before I was named Douglas because. When I was born, my mom said I had huge cheeks and look, looked like a chipmunk. So the name Chip stuck, but my dad put Douglas on the birth certificate, and I've always gone by Chip. So people know me as Chip, even though my driver's license says Douglas on it. See, so, I'm, I'm Alan Jr. I'm, I'm a junior, but since mm-hmm. there was already an Alan in the family, I became Brad. So there was that, and then Jeff, you know, the whole Styles thing. So he goes back and goes, we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just dying and laughing. You guys get to go all the way around. And he's like, no, 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 no. Kathy came up and saved us, and we got in there. But they gave us crap. For, I don't know if we went in there, and every time it was a problem with the lights, like, guys, just yep. put us in the system, whatever the lights is, <laughs> write it down next to the, the made-up name. So you, when we show up, you at least know who you're looking for. Had to deal with that every time every we went in. Every time we went in. <laughs> Somebody else at the gate. Well, like I said, every time Chip came, he used a different gate. I'm like, where is he now? Well, no, we don't go in that way. And then next week, where is he? <laughs> oh, that was great memories. That yep, was yeah. a wonderful experience. Mm-hmm. And thank you. Thank you both of you My guys pleasure. for letting me part of that. That was, that was awesome. What year was that? 12? 12? Uh... Yeah, because so seven years ago, yeah, two thousand twelve. It's amazing the whole thing was built in a little, a little more than a year. It like was thirteen months. It was crazy as a friend of mine was part of the demolition of, oh, really? of stuff that went together. So he was down there doing a bunch of the heavy equipment work. He calls me, and goes, "Dude, I'm working. They're building this other thing in, in Cars yeah. Land, and I'm doing the." So when I got here, it's like I had to call him, going, "You're not even going to believe what I'm working yeah, on here. Yeah. I'm working on the other end of what you were working well, it's on." Funny on day one when they broke the ground, that was the last original parking lot of Disneyland that was left. The last original flat oh. ground was where Cars Land went. And so when they broke it up, when John uh, Lasseter used the backhoe and broke it up, Chip painted him a custom helmet. And when he broke it up, I went over there and grabbed a piece of asphalt. Everybody goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm keeping this. 
So I had John sign it for me. I found it on a wall with a picture. That's of it. awesome. Then everybody else started grabbing their pieces of asphalt. And having John sign it, I go, no, this is this is original I'm a part Disney of the Disney Disney I go way parking back lot Disney stuff. But I'm like, that's the last original parking lot. Yeah, yeah that's that, a pretty cool. The final thing. ride when you left Disney. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah. 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 yeah, still waiting in line too. <laughs> what are we, now? If everybody's grabbing these pieces. What did you guys save them budget wise on getting rid of all the? Uh, the materials from demolition. <laughs> you guys ever get a kickback check on that? Should have sold it. Yeah, like bricks at the speedway. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, they'll do that. Um, Chip for a while had uh, railroad spikes off the original uh, I still have railroad a whole box a of them. Bo- really? Box of them. Yeah. Yeah, because we originally we were coming up with ideas. I had some of them gold plated, different colors, different things, silver plated, uh, nickel plated. What were you going to do with? Well, them? we were going to we were going to. Create some type of a frame deal that had a little, a little memorabilia. And, yeah. You could buy a spike. Yeah. So they gave me a whole box of them, and I did samples, sent them back to Disney, and they never got back to us and said which way they wanted to go. So I still have a box of original Disney spikes. I'll give you one if you come by, I, I along with well, one of those of, used up shirts. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, you'll wrap the shirt yeah. with yeah. the spike. It's funny, they're not that long. You think no. they're big, giant spikes are maybe four inches long. Here, see, it's uh, there you go. Some of the stuff you've given me, there you go. Have oh, I got oh, stickers. Have stickers. some stickers. Getting one of the dirty ones. Two of them, those can be pasty. I can put these over my eyes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> see, awesome. Thank you. Kind of like a podcast. Kind oh, of. We got a bunch of. Get the good one. There you go. Oh, that's one. There's one on there that says something like something guest or something. <laughs> Always a happy ending. Wow, there's something. That's on your sticker? <laughs> this is another. That's way of Alex. <laughs> no, it's. The book, the book was, was better. better. <laughs> oh, that's we're looking fun. At just so you know, we're looking at stickers. Oh, Stopped it, oh, slightly oh, off center. Which one's my favorite? Top dead, slightly off center. Which one are you looking for? Oh, that's mine's pretty a cool. special guest. It's gone? On my notebook. There's more than oh, back. This is one of my favorites. Probably not something. Right, right, yeah. More retarded. <laughs> All right, we'll say is that degrees. politically correct? I don't know. Not That's why not. we kind of keep that and one then quiet. This is, for, this is for Carson. I have that one. Special ah. guest. Yes. How many different ones are there? 13, 14, 14, 14. Lucky 13. That's my number, you know. There's one that was for a, uh, a certain automotive celebrity that was that we made for him. And was it you? Sorry, we hadn't thought of, hadn't thought of one for you yet. But it says uh, 300% less denim. <laughs> <laughs> you would approve, see? <laughs> I like that. There should be a line of shirts. 300% less. Perfect. We have to collect right. them all now. Like baseball right. cards. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks well, I think for, for being mine, on. you need to put uh, very much handmade, not bought. Oh, we have one. What? Well, do we, we don't have any of the have obviously one. not bought? We the have one. The one that says obviously not bought. Okay. Obviously, that's what it says. Mine always says bought. bread or bright. Dude, I will send rice. you one of those. I think I have one of the obviously not bought ones. I'll send you one. <laughs> yeah, we've tried to cover all sorts of. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you for doing this. My yeah, pleasure. Thanks, for coming back. I know your schedule is just. Yeah, I have that one in there. Yep. Top dead, slightly off center. Brad's all happy. Give him the tabletop. Yeah. Just well, speaking of, here. you guys have to sign this. Cool. Free and worth it. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Perfect. Are we done? I think yeah. we're done. Yeah. Really? That's just such a smooth ending. Yeah. Would you call it a happy ending? Well, there you uh, go. Everybody's smiling here That's at the right. table. It yeah. is happy. happy. Ending. <laughs> Are we happy you. it's done? Or yeah. Can we get, a, we get a group picture? It's not, yeah. it's not a real. Yeah, we need to get a group picture. It's not a real stressful deal, is it, on here? <laughs> we need to call Mike over here before he walks. Yes. Mike he's to he's right here. Let me do this real quick. Building six. Hang on one second. I'll give you a picture yeah, you can ask. I'll make sure. I'll make sure. Can you take a picture, please? Can you take a picture? No, I'm not trying to show you anything. Hang on my camera. Oh, you can take one with this, too. At work, it's like, all right, everybody stole your badges. We can't, yeah, we can't, we can't show badges. Yeah. No badges. Yeah. Cheese, everybody. Cheese, everybody. Cheese, everybody. Cheese, everybody. Okay, good. Hey, to us. Do you want to get a couple to my mom? Cool. Take it with that. Here, here, sit on. Good old mind. Sit on. Hey, I, I would like that. Oh, they're Clint, am I going to meet Jeff? 
How's it going? Hi, Chip. I'm, 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 I'm Good dad. to see you. Oh, cool. Pleasure meeting you, sir. Wonderful. He's the guy to pleasure blame to for this guy. Yeah. See, yeah. This yeah, is sorry. It's oh, his I'm fault. Sorry. Sorry. Take credit. That hurts my feelings. I'd say take credit. I for dropped him on his head a couple times when he was here. Yes, sir. Everybody here. We're going to get you their picture, too. Okay. What's up, cowboy? How are you? Thank you. Thanks, Jim. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, do one with mine, please. One more time, if you don't mind. They are working. Yes. They are yeah. real. They're not plastic. They're metal. Squeeze. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Ye